Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, happy 4th of July. Also, the V Team takes a look at Mo Brooks' rating among a major police organization. And it's the 400th episode of The Voice of Alabama Politics. everybody. All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. Welcome to The Voice of Alabama Politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and I'm joined today by Susan Britt, research guru extraordinaire. Hello. Charlie Walker, assistant to the editors at APR and New York Times freelance columnist. And Angie Horn, Republican strategist and woman you don't want to mess with. Welcome all. <laughs> hey, you got a bunch of women today, don't you, Bill? I do, man. Y'all scare me to death. Because <laughs> I know you. <laughs> hey, it is the 4th of July. Happy yep. Independence Day to all of us and all of our viewers. Happy 4th. Happy 4th, everybody. And the 400th episode of The Voice of Alabama Politics. Yay! Yes. Yes. Very In honor of the 4th of July, Hagler Hines, uh, the son of Nick Hines and Chandler, and Chandler Hines. Hines. Chandler works for us here. Painted this very special picture. We're greatly appreciative, and we thank you, Hayward. Thank you it's so for making pretty. our Fourth of July. Yes, we do. Susan, done. Well, let's get to it. A lot going on this week in the political world. I believe it's true that Republicans in Alabama and across the United States are pro blue lives. They are pro police, and I, I know I've worked with law enforcement for years and years have tremendous respect for them. We looked at a survey, a, a survey from uh, uh, the National Association of Police Officers, and surprisingly, they represent about a quarter of a million police officers. They endorsed President Trump for his reelection bid. But we found that U.S. Congressman from Alabama, Mo Brooks, is not actually high on their list of people who support police officers. He ranked pretty low, didn't he? He absolutely did. And, you know, the more we get to know Mo Brooks, the more we know that, unfortunately, Congressman Brooks has a lot of really loud rhetoric. But when you look at his record, the record doesn't match the rhetoric. It's unfortunate that he voted with the men and women in blue in this country about 43% of the time. Now, this isn't a partisan issue. Uh, you know, there's a Republican from California who voted 100% of the time. You have Senator Richard Shelby who voted 80% of the time. But this is this is becoming a pattern with Mo Brooks. Um, as we get past the rhetoric and start looking into the research, you know, Richard Shelby voted 91% of the time for the Trump agenda. Mo Brooks voted 73%. Mo Brooks only votes with um, with our police officers, 43%. And these weren't trick bills. These were things like providing bulletproof vests to our officers, providing, um, you know, care for the men and women who are who are out defending us. And so I'm not really sure how much longer Mo Brooks can get away with yelling and screaming one thing and saying, look what I say and not what I do, because his votes do not match the Republican conservative agenda that he talks about. And I think that's going to be a real problem for him as he, as he goes to, uh, to look toward a Senate campaign. Susan, it, I look at this like uh, uh, kind of like an abusive spouse kind of thing. Comes out and tells the world how much he l loves his wife or she loves her husband and then goes home and beats the heck out of him. You know, or doesn't feed the family. It, your vote is your support, not your big fat mouth. No, and that's what he's doing. He's running around screaming <coughs> and, and and causing all this ruckus. So you don't look at his voting record. So right. you don't look at who he actually is. And I don't think that's going to play very well with the voters next year. I just, 
I, at least I hope not. I hope they're really looking and paying attention to what's out there about him. It's just, it's Mo Brooks, and Mo Brooks only supports Mo Brooks. And this is just proof of that, and it's pretty disgusting. I mean, your dad is a has been a police officer for... Over 30 years. Over 30 years. And to think that he he's a Trump supporter, and yes. to think that Mo Brooks really doesn't support your dad. I mean, how does that make you feel? I mean, it's, on, it's just one of those things. Even a lot of Trump supporters like my dad, my dad can't stand Mo Brooks. Yeah. He, he doesn't resonate with the base like he thinks he is. So... You know. There you go. I don't. I don't know if your dad wanted to out him with that, but I Sorry. guess. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'll. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, and, and I want to move on from this. I mean, the fact that Terry Sewell, uh, Democrat from Birmingham, mm -hmm. voted double for what Mo Brooks did mm -hmm. is probably all you need to know about defunding the police. Mo Brooks is trying to defund the police. It certainly looks like it. Angie, there's another thing. Uh, we had fake outrage over. Uh, an event that uh, the Trump Organization wanted to hold at the USS Alabama. Uh, the, the, committed, the commission over the Alabama said that they didn't want to get involved in a partisan uh, public event like that. Jim Ziegler and his ilk have made a big deal out of this as if Governor Kay Ivey was the one who denied the permission. They want to start a battle between President Trump and Governor Kay Ivey for political purposes, don't you think? I do. And, and this story is just ridiculous. Accusing uh, Governor Ivey of having anything to do with the fact that a Trump rally is not being held on sacred military property is just ridiculous. Most political consultants, both Republicans and Democrats, consider things like battleships to not be proper places for partisan rallies. Those are those are sacred grounds. But, but I want to take it a step further here in Alabama. Um, we are a Trump state. We are conservative Republicans. I'm a Republican political consultant. But once you open that door and allow a candidate or a politician to have a partisan rally on that ground, you have to allow equal access. So mm -hmm. if AOC wanted to come here or Hillary Clinton then wanted to follow that up with a rally of their own at the USS Alabama, we wouldn't be able to stop it. And I just don't think that that's a door that the, that the commission wanted to open. And so I think they made the right decision because the last thing we want is AOC or Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders standing in Mobile on our USS Alabama holding a rally. Susan, do you, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, actually, they, they did ask the governor's office, but she didn't give an opinion on it. She sent it to the AG's office for opinion. And it is a partisan event. It absolutely is a partisan event. And like Angie said, it opens it up for everybody. Well, Steve Marshall in his infinite wisdom said that since uh, no one was running for office, that it wasn't a partisan event. Well, everybody Go knows figure. how blind he is. And not offer an official opinion. No, no. So, uh, so he got out of this by not offering an official opinion one mm -hmm. way or the other. Um, he offered his personal opinion, but not his official opinion, yeah, which yeah, certainly but, gave but, no cover to, to stop AOC or Hillary Clinton from, from coming exactly, down yeah. here and holding a rally. Charlie, you seem to have some thoughts here. Oh, I just wanted to have the opportunity to call Ziegler a troll again and just <laughs> say that this is him looking for another reason to rally support and push his Trump. Trump agenda, sorry. Well, Trump. he's looking to run for governor. That's obvious. He is. Yes. He's looking to put, push the Ziegler agenda. There you go. Exactly. I mean, if you look at the picture here, here he's got Ted Cruz on here. When, when, when Donald Trump was running, he was a Cruz man. Mm -hmm. But he, like Mo Brooks, is for whatever's good for him. Exactly. But we're going to have to leave it right there. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Happy Fourth of July. Your career isn't a job, it's a journey. Your next job could lead to bigger things, and you're in charge of how fast and how far you want to go. At alabamaworks.com, you can connect with employers and start working right now. Then chart your path forward with training and career planning tools. That next paycheck is great, but it's only the beginning. Start a great success story at alabamaworks.com. So you got caught speeding. But this time you got more than a ticket. What are you in for? Vehicular homicide. Stop speeding before speeding stops you.
Drive safe, Alabama. A message from your Alabama Department of Transportation. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Susan, this week, we learned, this last week, we learned that Speaker Mac McCutcheon will not seek re-election. Uh, he's been there since uh, Mike Hubbard uh, was uh, convicted, mm -hmm. and by all accounts, he's done a good job. He has done a good job. He took that seat from where Mike Hubbard was, you know, very punishing and, you know, very dictatorial, and when he took the speakership, he said, this will stop now, and this will become the people's house. And since then, he's run the run the uh, uh, house like the people's house. He says, you know, every, every house member there represents the same number of people as every other house member there, and then they deserve an equal voice. Angie, he cites that he, uh, you know, his uh, age and that he wants to enjoy his golden years. I, I think he'll go out on top. Uh, a tough job. Uh, you, you really got to be after it all the time. It is not a part-time job. It is a very full-time job. The Speaker of the House is an incredibly important decision. You know, when uh, Speaker McCutcheon took over in his speech on the floor accepting uh, the gavel to be speaker, he made the famous statement, the era of the imperial speaker is over. Yes. And yes. he certainly changed the culture of the way that the House works. I think that the challenge for the next speakers would be different for how it was for Speaker McCutcheon. You know, much like Governor Ivey didn't have much time before she became governor, you know, Speaker McCutcheon, that race was a very quick race because of uh, the conviction of, of former Speaker Mike Hubbard. This is going to be a, a much different race. You know, this is going to be between now and November of 2022. Right, so this right. is going to be a long, drawn-out race by all accounts. Um, but I, th I think you have two main players in it at this point and, and a clear front runner at this point. So it's going to be interesting to see how, how the next 15, 16 months play out. You know, and I've got a question for you. You, you do campaigns and uh, you do consulting. Uh, you know, during the election cycle 2018, Speaker McCutcheon was – actively involved in recruiting candidates and vetting candidates and and really determining to a large degree who would, you know, be the next uh, representative from a district. Uh, who does that vetting this time? Uh, because he's really going to be out uh, at that point. So, uh, first of all, I, you know, when Mike Hubbard was speaker, I think he very much chose the winner a lot of times. He did. He did. Uh, speaker McCutcheon had a, a different philosophy. He would meet with anyone who was running. So if there were four Republicans running for a seat, he would meet with all four, um, which was a, a, a different policy than Speaker Hubbard had. But to answer your question as to, um, you know, when, our, when we take our candidates to Montgomery to run the gauntlet, who is it they meet with on the fifth floor of the state house? I'm not sure, but that's certainly a conversation that we're all having. I think that you meet with Speaker McCutcheon um, because he is still, in fact, the speaker. But then I think you also have to take your candidates to meet with Representative Ledbetter and Representative Poole, because one mm -hmm. of them will be the next speaker when your candidate goes and gets sworn in as a member of the body. And Susan, that's the that's the race right now. Uh, Representative Bill Poole, uh, who who is the powerful uh, budget chair. Mm -hmm. He threw in his hat uh, uh, immediately. Yes. Uh, then the next, the following day, uh, Majority Leader uh, Nathaniel Ledbetter mm -hmm. uh, threw his hat in the ring. So in, in my estimation, these are two very good candidates. Mm -hmm. Now, Angie mentioned a second ago there's a front runner. But we'll have to get back to her on that. <laughs> but what, what's your take on this, Susan? I think they're both very strong candidates. They both have a very good record in the House. Um, equally as competent, equally as, uh, you know, thoughtful in, in what they do. It's going to be really interesting to see the race between these two guys. Yeah, and whether it be Poole or Ledbetter, I'm very interested just to see how the dynamic in the House will change, if at all, you know. Right. Well, it, de they definitely have different styles. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a, a different style. And so, Angie, you alluded to a clear front runner. So... Enlighten us. We're in week, well, we're in week one of a 15-month speaker race. But I yeah, think the yeah. fact that Representative Poole came out first, um, and I think the fact that he has been budget chair gives him gives him an advantage in this at this point. But again, we've got 15 months. So, um, but 
in a speaker's race, whoever comes out first and, and reaches out to their members first, um, traditionally has has done well in the in the final ballot. Well, like I said, both of them do have done a good job. Uh, there's going to be a big, big turnover mm -hmm. uh, in the House and the Senate. I mean, uh, you know, we were talking earlier. There could be as many as uh, twenty mm -hmm. seats turnover in the in the House, and some six or more in the. <clears throat> I mean, Senate. We already know uh, some of them. I mean, uh, if you look at Alan Farley, I don't think he's running again. Uh, we we know that Wes Allen is not running again. There's uh, Mike Ball's not Mike running. Ball's not running I again. I believe Rich Wingo. Rich Wingo, we running. hear, is not running again. I mean, uh, this 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 changes the dynamic. I mean, Angie, you know, we saw about twenty five people, uh, new people come in the last quadrillion. Now we get another twenty or so. Mm -hmm. It really changes the mix, doesn't it? It does. So this <clears throat> in this session or in this quadrillion the largest freshman class we've had in anyone's recent memory. Um, and they were really able to, to get to know each other and to, to sort of stick together on a lot of things and, and uh, maybe made some of the leadership uncomfortable at times um, because they were sticking together so much. What you're about to see is another, you know, two dozen as well join those guys. So your freshman and sophomore are going to be majority likely of the Republican caucus. And that is going to be a power shift like we haven't seen in a very long time. So when you, if this speaker's race gets really close, it could likely be determined by 20 people who have not yet been seated in the legislature. That's a good point. I guess I'd be out there fundraising. <laughs> 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 but I mean, Susan and, and the, uh, in the Senate, we, we, we understand that Jimmy Holly is not going to run, long-serving, 44 years. Uh, Dale Marsh, mm -hmm. uh, former president pro tem. Not Jim running. McClendon. Jim McClendon, uh, health chair. Uh, that's going to be a vacuum there. Uh, that's going to be. That's, that's just as equally uh, as large of a uh, power shift as it's going to be in the House. And, and because when you're talking about out of 35, you're talking about you got five, six. That's... A, a major power shift. There. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, Angie, we're hearing that uh, uh, folks are lining up for Jimmy Holly's seat. One of the names coming up is Mike Jones. So Senator Holly is my senator. Um, yeah. And I'll tell you what the Senate's really going to miss with Senator Holly, besides his leadership and institutional knowledge, is he knows the rules of the Senate better than anyone in that building. And in the Senate, where you only have 35 serving, one person who has a grasp of the rules like Senator Holly does changes yep. the game on a daily basis just in terms of strategy. But, yes, you are hearing Mike Jones's name. You're hearing some other names around. But I think until anyone makes an official announcement that they're running for that seat, this is anybody's ballgame. And that's a, right. very, that's a very different district down here. This is the heart right. of the wiregrass. You have military. You have agriculture. We make missiles. We make helicopters. We grow peanuts. You name it, we do it down here. So it's going to be a very different wow. kind of legislative race. Okay. We're going to have to let that be the last word. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back celebrating our 400th episode and the 4th of July. You'll never guess what 400,000 people in the U.S. were using when they crashed their cars last year. No, nope, not this. This. Distracted driving will kill you. Drive safe, Alabama. A message from your Alabama Department of Transportation. The long, laborious debate in the walls of the Continental Congress finally comes to an end. They have voted. They have declared independence from Great Britain. And that night, by candlelight, John Adams writes an emotional letter to his beloved Abigail. Speaking of Independence Day, he writes, This day will be, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I'm apt to believe it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration. Yet, through all the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory. 
I can see that the end is more than worth all the means. But I must submit all my hopes and fears to an overruling providence in which, unfashionable as the faith may be, I firmly believe. May we never forget that we are a people who have been delivered. From tyranny to liberty, from oppression to freedom, from fear to courage. And today, above all days, may we renew our personal devotion to the giver of all liberty. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You know, in many ways, in my mind, uh, July 4th is, is perhaps, you know, the most sacred holiday, the most sacred day in our nation. Uh, we declared uh, independence from England in such a way that no one had ever done it. We said that monarchs did not have the God-given right to rule. We, we determined that uh, self-determination, a, 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 a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, <coughs> was the ideal. Mm -hmm. Now, we have not always lived up to that ideal. If we were back in the day, I would be the only person on this panel that could vote. Yep. So we have progressed in our idea of liberty and justice for all and equal rights. It, we've expanded that. And while I want to talk about the greatness of our nation, I also want to be cautionary and say, as my grandmother used to say, you can always backslide. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, us to, I think everyone here loves this country and the country has loved them back. But we have to guard liberty and justice for all. And it's by remembering the foundation of this country, I believe, Susan. Right. And it wasn't just because you're a man that you could vote. You couldn't vote unless you were a landowner and had some degree of education as well. So that we really, really come a long way even just from that. Um, yeah. To be able that now everybody has the right to vote and everybody has the right to pick their own representatives and senators and et cetera to represent them as a whole. Angie, it's amazing to live in America in 2021 and be a free free individual and have all the blessings we have. Uh, there are some that are left behind, but we continue to try to bring everybody forward. You know, we live, we truly do live in the greatest nation on earth. And, you know, I'm the mother to a seven-year-old son. And I try to, to instill in him that this is being an American is an honor, but it's also a responsibility. Yeah, and yeah. I think that we all have to take the responsibility very seriously of the responsibility of Americans to want to make a better life for their children than they have themselves. And that gets harder and harder because we do have such a good life here in America. And, you know, the <coughs> idea that we need to continue to work hard to make our country even better, to leave it to our children, and they need to make it better to leave it to their children. It really is a responsibility that I hope that people of my generation and people that are in their 20s and 30s now will look at and say, we really need to step up to the plate because we have been left the greatest country on earth. And it's ours to, to take and to make even better. And it always is a challenge uh, for each generation to because America gets written anew. I mean, the foundation principles get written anew. It's certainly different than it was in the past. But like, like Charlie's generation and uh, then our generation and mm -hmm. uh, your generation, we all have a responsibility, as you say, to make it better. I, re I really like that, that we have a responsibility, because while we've all been saying such great things and how amazing it is to live in this country, there are a lot of people who, you know, are still living in poverty. We need to be working on, you know, police brutality, social justice reform. Uh, there are so many things that we still need to accomplish. But, you know, I, I still obviously agree this is the greatest country, but there is still so much more work to be done. And I think that's a perspective that I, I appreciate. And I think... Uh, the younger generation gets accused uh, too often that they are complacent, that they don't care. But we've seen in the last couple of years where where people of your age have really stepped up. You know, I know you've really stepped up in, in your, your thinking and the way that you want to see the country 
not leave anyone behind. I've tried it. A lot of millennials are moving in that direction, getting, you know, as the term is woke, you know, they're, they're a lot more progressive in their ideals. And, and, and sometimes there's a negative stigma about that when, because a lot of us say, well, not me per se, but a lot of them say, you know, we need to get those old white guys out of there. Well, you know, a lot of those old white guys did do very good things for us. But I do partially agree that it is time for maybe a younger generation to move into political positions. Agreed. Now, I will say one thing, because I know when, when I was young and, and like you, wanted to get all the old guys out of there. And then once I got really involved and realized that, like Senator Hawley, they're there for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because they have the institutional knowledge, because they know how to work the system to make bills that need to get through through. Exactly. So it, it's it, there's there's a reason. Well, it's being one of those older white guys. I don't want to go anywhere, but I I agree with the sympathy. <laughs> uh, I do. It's just like I, I often say that the smartest you know man in the room over at the state house is a woman, but you still do, don't always have the first chair. You don't have it the first seat, and that's what I mean about that. America is constantly evolving mm -hmm. based on principles and ideals you know, and the rule of law. I do have to move on. This is our 400th episode. Congratulations. Congratulations, yeah. everybody. Us. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I would be remiss without thanking so many people who have made this all possible. And, you know, I will miss some, but, you know, of course, Jonathan Barbie, our producer, has always done a great job of making us look good. Uh, you know, he, he, he takes a, a Coca-Cola pocketbook and gives us a champagne look. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, Joel Brewer, of course, with sound and lighting, has always done a fabulous and, and job. And Kurt Brewer, his brother, his brother was the original helped start us off. Uh, I think that one of the things, uh, you know, I look back on the folks who first started with us, Charlotte uh, Skaggs, uh, Jack Campbell. Claire Austin. Uh, Claire Austin, our dear friend Beth Clayton mm -hmm. Pierce. Uh, so many people that have really helped Chandler us out. Chandler Hines, he was with us. Chandler now. Hines, still with us and doing great. I mean, so many people to thank, Angie. And, and you've only been with us a short time, but we've known you for a long time. Yeah, we've known you for a long time. And you've seen long. this grow. Yeah, you know. So we appreciate you 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 being on with us when you can. And congratulations, guys. I mean, you know, you you are able to get political issues to people in a concise and accessible way, and and that's something that that America and Alabama certainly need. So congratulations. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Susan, what are your thoughts? Oh, and congratulations to our viewers. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, without our viewers, we wouldn't <laughs> have a show. Here. And our sponsors. And uh, without our viewers, we wouldn't have sponsors. Yeah. So, yes, our sponsors and our viewers, we truly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, it has truly been a family effort. It has. And I remember someone saying one time that uh, you are bound to fail, Britt, and I'd like to say to that person, not yet. Nah. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it right there. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You watch us because we watch them.